Good. So, hello, Stefan. Um, I'm very happy to record this interview today. What? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm very happy to record this interview today. Um, we are at the family. Just have a, just a, look, a quick look at our space. Here we are. And um, we are the family. It's um, not an incubator. It's not a, a startup accelerator. It's a long-term uh, investor in Paris. So it provides three things to the startups. Uh, first, um, capital, education, and unfair advantage. So um, this is the family. Uh, this is the family. And um, a few months ago, we have launched Unchain My Art which is a program dedicated to artists and to help them to acquire this startup mindset, this uh, entrepreneurial mindset, and to um, acquire also digital tools to make their own promotion online, of course. So this is why we are interviewing you now, today, uh, to talk a little bit about this, um, this situation in art, in the art market, uh, and so on. Okay, so maybe we can start with you, um, a little presentation of who you are, what you do in the market, your background, and so on. I mean, basically, if you want to know about me, you've got to go to a website called Subco's, Subco's Club. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm a hybrid. I'm a collector, a dealer, a consultant, an advisor, a financier, a wholesaler, a distributor. Uh, 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 I, I function in a way that is very difficult to define in the art world because um, I have many different roles and functions, sometimes all at the same time. Um, and I'm also a photographer. So, you know, I take pictures, a lot of pictures. And, uh, I shoot for Italian Vogue, um, and I, I, I document just about every day of my life, and then share it on social media and Facebook. So I, I'm a there's, a there's a very big narrative to mm -hmm. my my art dealing practice. You can, you can maybe if it's farm or the information too, you'll really get an idea about my life, my family, my people, my day to day activities, who I'm connected to socially. It's extremely transparent. <clears throat> And, and I, I don't mean like transparent in the sense like I only show what I want to show, but it's really a, a, a pretty a pretty transparent sort of uh, exhibition of my life, which is very unusual for an art dealer or gallerist yeah. because the gallery is really focused on promoting their artists. And in, in the world we live in, very few people have an idea about the identity of the gallery or dealer behind the scene. People okay, have yeah. a relationship mm. with them. They may have met them, had dinner with them, but a very small group of people have a relationship with the dealer mm -hmm. or a knowledge of, of who the dealer is or mm -hmm. the opinions of the dealer, political opinions of the dealer. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because you started in the film industry, you know, in Hollywood, because you had this um, this kind of sharing, the sharing image, you know. Is it, I mean, you started as a producer, is it right? You know, I, I think there's like need to find a reason for why I am like I am. Like, <laughs> let's find a reason why a hedgehog is a hedgehog. You know what I mean? Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a hedgehog. You know, I mean, I, I think it's like trying to grapple with why I'm like this, blaming on the film industry. Yeah. yeah. No. I, 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 I don't think I don't think so. I think people in the film industry are are equally hidden. I think you'll find very few successful producers or, or even film directors messaging publicly on Facebook or whatever mm -hmm. they, they generally maintain a level of privacy. I, I think that I think that I think that the you know my reason behind it is is I, I think you can provide a sort of a, a real social context behind what you do and how you do it. And mm -hmm. I think it's I, I think a lot of people don't message because they want to cultivate neutrality. There's, there's sort of this notion that neutrality is good for business, <laughs> which it certainly is. And I, I admonish this. I, I think that we should have positions that we stand for and that then people can navigate their themselves from those positions. Mm. Um, but we live in a world where sort of neutrality is, is something that sort of the, the liberal establishment uh, has sort of has sort of said has sort of created a, a an environment where it's it, it's sort of you, you don't want to have a position. Positions are very negative. I I, I think the opposite stand. Mm. You're radical. I'm, I'm not radical. I, I, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a white Jew from South Africa. 
from an affluent family who went to like a private boarding school in England at seven. I went to Connecticut. I, I wouldn't say I'm radical. No. I, I, it, it seems like that when we read newspapers, when, when people call you the Satan of the art world, of the art world, or the, the Donald Trump of the art world, it seems to be radical from the outside. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't drink, I don't do drugs. But I, yeah. I, I, I don't, going out at night, I, 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 I try and walk twenty thousand steps yeah. a day. I'm very practical, very risk averse. I mean, I, I think, I think. The uh, description of radical is anything that, that is outside of their understanding or comprehension. So, you know, so like out of their aesthetic range, if they don't see it or understand it or have an experience it, therefore it's radical. So I think, I think these terms are really misused, radical, green, centric. No, I just, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think so. I, 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 I don't classify myself as radical. I, I just classify myself as sort of you know, not, not conservative or liberal, but I'd say I just speak my mind, mm. you know, and, and I, I don't edit myself. If that's radical in the 21st century, <laughs> God, God bless you. <laughs> okay, so let's move on, maybe. Um, if, if yeah. It's radical it's a very, it's very poor spring time. Mm. Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, so, um, so the idea of this um, program, Unchain My Art, is to, um, well, compare artists as entrepreneur or entrepreneur as artist. We think that both uh, artists and entrepreneurs do things that don't scale. To uh, take this, uh, this sentence by Paul Graham, uh, who also wrote this book, uh, Hackers and Painters. I, I'm curious to know your uh, opinion on this comparison, on these two populations. Um, I think I I I, I, I think it's um, you know it's it's interesting. I, I've I've never encountered like a venture capital firm kind of giving artists digital media skills and training to be entrepreneurs. But I I do think that that one of the failures of the art schools for for, for both artists and curators is their lack of practical training. And, mm. um, and I think it's I think it's, it's from a curriculum point of view. I think one of the one of the great evils of the art world are the art schools, and and I I, I think that they are the entities that extract capital and and from the artists at scale in a way that is completely um, problematic. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's anyone in the art system that's able to make money from people's desire to be artists at at real scale, mm -hmm. you know, at forty thousand dollars a pop a year at at like a hundred thousand students a year at the mm. art schools. You know, these guys are able to extract more, you know, more money from failed from, from artists who have no chance of succeeding mm. than anyone in the in the world. But these guys, these are the guys who sort of preach the the, the mythology of the artist, the ethics of an art practice, the the unfairness of the system in not accepting you. So they they sort of teach you, take your money, and then and then fetishize the failure that you will probably experience as being responsible on the system of capitalism and its inherent problems in, in, in not valuing and valorizing your, your your creative output. And they sort of so they they kind of extract your capital and fill you with sort of pseudo leftist, pseudo Marxist ideas. So when you leave, you have you you know, I failed. I spent all this money at art school in the capitalist system. It's, you know, you know, I'm a Marxist, so it's a, it's a very ironic system. It's kind of a capitalistic system that preaches Marxism mm. and, and, and and leaves you with 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 sort of left leaning thinking that that you know, when you fail, you kind of can, you, you have a, you have an excuse for it. And I I do think that very simply, artists really do should understand the basic laws of supply and demand. So I think they should do basic econ degrees. I think they should. They should have. They should understand the basics of of what what every producer of goods and services in the world has to understand in order to be successful, and and what every distributor or retailer of goods and services needs to understand to be successful. And they don't. Mm -hmm. And worse than that, they're they're sort of left with these sort of ideological mythologies of right and wrong, left and right, that that really alienate them from 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 these systems. And, and, and for the most part, make it very difficult for them to, 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 to deal practically with their, with their creative output or their endeavors. And I think this is also 
true on the curatorial study side. I mean, I have a friend, Cesar Garcia, who runs an institution called the Mistake Group, and he's mm-hmm. an amazingly impressive guy in his early 30s, and he comes from absolutely no means or, or, or capital whatsoever. He started this, this nonprofit foundation, amazing. And he was telling me one day that, you know, when he was getting his curatorial studies degrees, they never taught him that one day you might be running a foundation and you might need to host a gala in which you might need to wear a tie. I, I don't know how to tie a tie. No, mm. my parents never had money. I never wore a tie. Not only that, I had to do a budget. No one taught me how to use Excel to do a budget for mm. my foundation. So they taught me all this curatorial study stuff, but, but I run a foundation now and I have no skills to run an organization. And I do think that that that, that, that really the art schools itineraries are, 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 are highly problematic for the, for, for the long-range success of, of, of their student bodies. Um, and, and, and as such are one of the, the fundamental pillars in the industry that, that needs to be changed, challenged, uh, and, and upgraded. Mm-hmm. This is what you call morality in the arts, because you, you often say we have to, to, to stop with the morality of art, we have to stop with by using some words, some precise words, like like museum is better collector than private collectors, because this often comes in your in your interviews, morality. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, I, mean I, I think, like, if I, if I, you know, you know, I often try to think about how do I, how do I boil my... Uh, my theory is down to a single idea that is, that is scalable. Like, what is what is the message beyond the noise of he did this and she did that and this gallery is good or this person? And I think the the morality issue is really, and it's something I think is at the very core, fundamentally, of our socio political and economic system mm-hmm. as as essentially the the the, 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 the disease, the, the 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 cause of the disease of so many ills in, in the system. And what society has done, it, 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 and, and what, what, what systems of, of consumption have done, and systems of, essentially the social, economic, political system has, has, has really manipulated people's morality and their ideas of morality to sort of extract resources from them at scale. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump outside the art business because I think it's a, a, a more adequate example, the healthcare industry. You know, 75% of all expenditures in healthcare are spent in the last six months of people's lives. Mm. So we have underfunded healthcare systems across the globe. And one of the reasons is, is, is as we are able to keep people's people living longer, you know, as you, as you get into your 90s and you're, you're literally body begins to fall apart, um, you can be kept alive. You can have mm. like, giving hip surgeries to, to 90-year-olds and mm. triple bypasses to people who are 94 and keeping people alive with septic shock in the, when they're 96. And this is where the ball, and it comes to this moral issue of <coughs> the doctor must preserve life, mm-hmm. this lack of acceptance, this moral acceptance of, of the passage of time. Or we go to the prison system in America, whereby tough on crime, and you basically have criminalized just about you know, every, every non-violent crime into a situation where you're spending $40,000 a year keeping people in prison, mm. which, which, which creates revenue. And it these all come down to, 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 to creating moral myths that are completely incoherent that increase consumption and, and growth, because the economic system is, is essentially defined on, on two metrics, growth and full employment. Mm. In, in, in the post-war period, you know, there's a fixation on governments to basically have full employment and have constant growth. So you have healthcare growth, mm-hmm. which is which is which is which is not necessarily good. You, you, you have the fast food industry give people diabetes. It's still the diabetes growth in consumption on the healthcare side and growth in consumption on the fast food side is fantastic, but it's 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 not good growth. So so. In order for society on a whole to really break itself out of this trap, we've got to deal with the, with, with the morality issues of how we identify as a species with good and bad, with right and wrong. Mm-hmm. In the art industry, 
is a very interesting place because it really is the crucible of, of the elites and it's the crucible of intellectual morality and, and, and advancement in which the elites play. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hypersensitized to, to, a, to a lot of structures. So it deals with the artist produces as a mythical figure. He loves his art. Yeah. Everything is done because he's pure doesn't like money, doesn't care for money. He's, it's all about the art. This is a myth. Picasso had a Rolls Royce in the 1920s. He loved mm. money. You know, Bernard Buffet. Uh, Mark, and, yeah. Yeah, Mark Rochon, one of my favorite artists, drives around LA mm. in, a, in a Bentley you know, with a driver. You know, uh, you know, and, and, and there's this myth that, that artists are not capitalists, that they don't want money. And, 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 and many of them who fail are like, oh, well, I don't like money. It's, you know, they, they never have a chance. But, and, and this myth needs to be broken down. Artists like money. Artists are often <sighs> greedy like everyone else. You know, there, there's these sort of myths that are false. And, and when you, you then start to deal with artists in a very specific way. Mm. You, know, you, you, you deal with them in a mythical sense. So you're really not human. And the artist essentially feels obli obli obliged to fulfill his, his role as, 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 as he should. In, in, in playing this role, this, this, this mythical role. So everyone ends up playing with each other in inauthentic terms. They, they end up playing with the reflection of what they're supposed to be, their mythical. Mm. And you go to the collector. The collector, of course, must be a connoisseur. What is a connoisseur? A connoisseur is a middle class person with money who has, who, who has acquired through the action of knowledge taste and and he can taste the difference between a good wine and a bad wine. He can see a good painting from a bad painting. Uh, so they've they've mythologized the sense of connoisseurship. Now very few people actually do have knowledge and very few people have the natural instinct for taste because taste is something that like like speed in an athlete is, mm -hmm. is a talent that, that is given only to a few. It's mm -hmm. not something that you acquire. You can acquire you know the running ability to run 100 mm, meters. It's, it's a muscle. It's, 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 it's some people just have that that thing. So we so the art business has created this concept of connoisseurship, which which elevates the middle class bourgeois into sort of this elite state of intellectual authority and good taste. And many of these connoisseurs have terrible taste, uh, but but they have they 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 they're sort of creamed in the system as as this role. They join the museums. Mm. Again, it's a it's a moral issue of, of elevation and, and status acquisition, and 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 then the you know the gallerist, of course, is 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 uh, is someone who cares only for his artists and and who doesn't show his ideas or doesn't communicate. That's the artist communicates. The there's the myth of the gallerist. There's the myth of the curator. There's the myth of the writer who writes for art forum or for the magazines or. Who, who is pure and only writes about those things that he, he, he can't be bought. But, but, but people can be bought in different ways because people have different values for different currencies in life. Some people value capital more than status. So status is a currency or belonging to a group is a currency. So the currencies are quite different. And we've got these mythologies that, upon which these pillars are built. Artists go to art school to learn how to be artists. They get critiqued by some usually failed artist who sits there and explains them how to make art. And these mythologies have really extracted resources and capital from, from the creative community at, at, at massive scale. And they've also created, ironically, a monoculture of distribution and cultural production that, that actually gets out there by mm. creating these, these sort of these self-enforcing and reinforcing um, uh, modes of production and modes of consumption that have really sort of, uh, you, you know, you know, we're, we're in the year 2017, and when you meet young bankers in their early 30s who just made their first killing, they're talking about buying an Andy Warhol. You know, they're not mm. talking about buying a young artist who, they, who, who, who they've seen in their community. They, 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 they're talking about buying an artist who's making work in 1960. Mm. This is, this, and this is what's to Oh, well, you have knowledge. This is connoisseurship. So it's not like in the 1960s where you would buy Andy Wall and like very few people heard of when you were a young banker and made some money and when, you know, <laughs> we've, we've really kind of taken all the, all the, all, a lot of the good out of the system. Mm -hmm. And what's very interesting to me is we have a, a globalized world with globalized production and uh, amazing resources. I think artists today are producing 
better quality work than they've ever produced in the history of mankind. They've got better resources. They've got access to the internet. They've got access to historical data and information. They've got they've got they've got access to better materials than anyone in the history of the world mm. has ever had. You know, there's been technological advancements in pigment and production and output. So I, I, I strangely think we live in like a golden age of art production, but yet we've got a problem in that the distribution channels and production channels have been marginalized and alienated by these sort of by these sort of essentially moral myths of, of what kind of role you're supposed to have. So some of the most interesting artists who I find, you know, I, you know, I had tea yesterday with a, an artist named Molly Soda, who mm. is, uh, she, she is a wonderful artist who we're, we're going to work with. And we've, I've been following him for two years. And Molly's never heard of most of the well-known artists that, that you know today. She's never heard of Many of the names were collected by most collectors. I was with them. I'm like, do you know this person? She's like, no. Do you know this person? No. Do you know this mm. person? No. I'm like, she just has built her community online. She doesn't, she, she has a gallery in London, but nothing really. But she really has no idea who mm. any of these people are. And yet, she's known by hundreds of thousands of people. And she's on the list of, 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 of people like yourself yeah. who know her. So she's done a very good job of just, on her own, building her identity and her aura <laughs> Outside of outside of the network, outside of the mythology of the art business, so this very is, successfully. This is a very interesting example. Molly Soda is like a, a post-internet artist, and you are very close to a lot of post-internet artists. We we call them like this, but nobody really know like me what it is. So maybe you can explain a little bit, uh, like uh, Petra Cortrack works, um, um, for example, Mark Horowitz, uh, Artie Virkins, because you you are very close to this group who is based in Los Angeles. So maybe Los Angeles. Well, no, well, no, Molly is not based. On no, Los not Molly, but well, the others. <laughs> Artie Birkett lives in New York. Molly Soto was living in Detroit. Petra was from Santa Barbara. Okay. <coughs> what, it's, so uh, the place has nothing to do with it. One of the one of the principal and primary attributes of post internet, it does not have a geographical mm. centrality. Uh, the periphery. One of my mantras is the periphery is the new center in a networked mm. environment. I repeat that the periphery is the center in a networked mm. environment. It's the new center. So as you create a network, the, <coughs> then the periphery is as important as the center. This is one of the fundamental changes underway in the art industry, um, where you see peripheries like Molly Soda being networked into the center without without being without without being central to the mm. conversation as it was as it was built in the post war period. Post internet is, is is the simplest way to explain it is when the internet began there was there weren't centralized uh, places like Facebook mm. or Google. There weren't central sort of monopolies of, 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 of groups of people. It was a place of discovery. You'd go to a website. You'd discover a website. You'd write down the URL. You'd then go there. It was like being in a forest that was uncleared. And as people got onto the net, they would, they would find new trees or build new trees. And this was the environment that a lot of these, these internet artists kind of grew up in, the sort, of, the sort of like age of discovery. As the internet consolidated, into these sort of monolithic uh, entities, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Snapchat, we all know what they are, we're all on that. Uh, essentially, that pre-internet environment got decimated, the forest got cleared, literally. Like mm. the Amazon jungle got cut down, and we were left with essentially mm. these giant data center shopping malls in which everyone everyone walks. You know, we all, each one of us now is, 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 is at one of these huge malls. The forest is no longer there. So we are currently in a post-internet environment. Mm. So, so okay. the, 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 this is this is my definition of what post-internet is. It's, it's, it's the environment after the internet was discovered. We're, we're sort of we're like it's almost like a post-apocalyptic environment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dystopian or utopic? <laughs> it, 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 it you know it has it has elements of both. Mm. And, and 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 these and these post-internet artists. Sort of, I think, work in this environment, and their their experience of art in the world. Petra was thrown out of two art schools. She doesn't even have a bachelor of arts in 
it, she doesn't have, doesn't have a BA in arts, mm. which is very unusual. Most galleries, I had an artist who was what was in a group show at a gallery, and they refused to put him in the show because he didn't have an MFA. Mm. And he and he and he quipped to the gallerist, "I have something better." The gallerist was, "What's that?" And he said, "I have Stefan Simkin." <laughs> they put him in the show. They put him in the show, and the only thing that sold in the show was his work. Ironically, because so, you sent your collectors. <laughs> I, I didn't send my collection. Okay. <laughs> his, his work was better than everything else in the show. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a, I, I don't, I don't have a, you know, I just do my job and find great art. I don't have a rigged game. People find the art. I'm not constructing some mythological, satanic narrative of, of, you, you know, it's, it's all bullshit. It's just I try and find good artists that that. Mm. Uh, I, I think people will like and people want to hang on their walls and people want to collect. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. You know, I'm not trying to find art that, like, the curator has to write a 10 page essay on and the museum has to show so the fucking bourgeois connoisseur can sort of be like, oh, look, I bought this piece of dog scrap that mm. I can put in the corner of my toilet that mm. I don't understand. I, I like stuff that when you put it on the wall, you look at it and you're like, wow, this is cool. I dig this. You know, I, 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 I'd like more of this, you know. Uh, it's pretty simple for me. Art has a decorative component that's very important. That's why when you look at a picture of Bunny Mellon's barn in the Hamptons, she had a 15-foot Mark Rothko uh, mm. sitting there, and then she had a 20-foot bench in front of it. Now, it wasn't mm. like this spiritual, like iconic thing. The Mark Rothko function is an object decorative for mm. Bunny Mellon, as it does for so many of the wealthy that allegedly are connoisseurs who buy art for its true spiritual meaning and the fact that museums collect it. Mm. I got news to you, they buy art that's to decorate their goddamn homes. <clears throat> These myths are false. So 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 what what happens with the post internet artists? They they do two things. They experience art history through the net. So instead of walking to the Met and the museums and going to art history classes and, and, and coming to the art schools, their consumption of art history happens online. So it's a very different consumption because it's not as linear. Mm. It's, I, I use the Google a tree, you know, and then you get a picture of a tree done by Goya and you get a picture of a tree in Hyde Park. You get a picture of, a, of an anime tree. So the way that images and culture come to you on the Internet is kind of like it's abstracted. It's not like uniform and linear. So their, their constructs of culture are very different to the, the pre-internet artists or the artists who kind of went through these academies and, and sort of got canonized with yeah. like, Donald Judd is God. He's the master of, you have to deal with Donald Judd and his legacy. And you've got to deal with what it is to be a painter in the shadow of abstract expressionism. And how do you deal with minimalism in the shadow of Donald Judd? And how do you deal with pop and the legacy of Andy Warhol? Mm -hmm. Some of these artists have escaped this, um, this, this like, this, this like, you know, this, this beam of, you know, the Star, star Wars, the, the, the beam that pulls the ship in, you know, yeah. so you can't escape. Yeah. It, they somehow escaped that beam of post-war art history because they weren't connected. I mean, I, 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 I have this analogy, if you ever see the Battle, Battlestar Galactica with Captain Adamo. You know Battlestar mm, no, Galactica? No, no, no. <coughs> so basically... <coughs> So basically, the Earth gets invaded by cyborgs, and the Earth has a defense system, and, and, and everyone's connected. All the defense mm. systems are connected to this network, and the cyborgs have been at war with, with Earth for a long time. And they figure out a way how to hack the Earth's defenses by putting a virus in the defense system so the shield goes down. And Captain okay. Adamo is the captain of an old battle starship called the Battlestar Galactic which he never trusted the network, so he never put a ship on the network. So when the cyborgs attacked and destroyed the Earth, the Battlestar Galactica was the last remaining ship on Earth. And, and he then leads a ragtag of surviving ships to find a new home, find a new Earth, because he wasn't connected to the network. So okay. in, a sense, in a sense, these artists are like the Battlestar Galactica. They're not connected to that same network that that has sort of like been regurgitated and shoved down everyone's throat they're kind of like in free form looking for a new world and i really think like this post-internet environment kind of opens up a whole new narrative for kind of art and its production released from the confines and restrictions of the post-war um of the post-war art period that is extremely rigid and monolithic mm. in both its in out in both its output 
in both its 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 constraints, in both its its requirement that everyone collect the canon. Sort of, it, it has this sort of it has this mechanism that really creates a monoculture of collecting yes. because it sort of has built this. Like, if you're a connoisseur, if you understand the canon, and if you understand the canon and collect the canon, then you can become a connoisseur with good taste who, who owns this this group of art. So it's been a really great construct, <clears throat> and and certainly these are great artists. I, I, I'm not. I, I think these are, this period is very important. I mean, I, I, I love Nauman, Judd, Kelly, all of these guys are major artists who, whose work I love. But this post-war canon from like the 1950s on to like the early 2000s is a very good construct. But what it, what it's done, it's kind of created a closed system hmm. whereby, and it's a very convenient system because you have a certain restricted amount of artists who've been canonized within this period. You have a collector base who basically can be elevated by understanding the canon, collecting the canon. They can be monocultured, which means prices can be raised, and you can build a real market. Auction houses can sell the material. There's a, there's a finite level of production. And, and what people who, who, who market this canon always say, they never say that there's a lot of great production out there. They never say, oh, there's great art being produced. There. What they say is, the connoisseur of collecting go, I focus on blue chip art. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm a serious collector now. I'm not graduated collector of canon. So ironically, what they've done is like this methodology sort of a, it kills the competition. So everything else is shit except this. In the 1960s, they made better art than today. <coughs> they don't. Mm. So, they, there's, great, there's great art today. But what it does, it, the market can kind of mm. can raise prices, can build this sort of, this, this sort of corporatized structure around it and can scale. And what's very interesting to me is how do you how, how do you, how do you change that system? How do you how do you sort of get people to engage in culture outside of that canonical constraint, which is at the center extremely elitist, profoundly available for only a handful of people mm. to, to to collect? And and there are a few tactics and techniques that have been used to sort of promote this canon. There's been this mythology that good art is not decorative. So, so you'll often ask someone about like Joseph Elvis, and they'll be like, oh, he's not a decorative artist. He is a decorative artist. Mm. He's a great artist, and he's a conceptual artist, but there is no artist whose, whose capabilities to decorate are greater than Joseph Elvis. So again, they want to, they want to sort of take away sort of these, 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 these sort of things so they can say to the car, so well, you collect Joseph Elvis not because you're collecting decoration, because you're sophisticated, you understand. Meanwhile, the real reason for why most people buy this stuff is because my, Obama in the White House had a designer named Michael Smith, who, mm. who, who is a very sort of banal sort of American designer, doesn't have particularly good taste, so a lot of people work with him. He puts he puts the Joseph Elvis in the in the Obama White House because mm. it, it fits as a as a you know <clears throat> so like when we start to get rid of the mythology of why people do certain things we can sort of start to have much more honest dialogues and, and, and relationships mm. with people and, and 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 really escape these monocultures of distribution and production which is which is interesting to me how to get people outside of the the box okay so it, it leads me to two questions so you think that you are living like in a kind of renaissance in a new renaissance do i think we're living in a renaissance like the florence in the in the 15 and 16th century you know because we we were talking about I, I, about I, art again. but if if we take talk about technologies uh, mindsets there is a lot of comparison that we can make I, no? I, 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 I think people like to make comparisons to say that things are like the past because it makes us feel safe so if we say oh we're in the new renaissance then we feel like the future is predictable mm. and, the, and, and, and the, the time we live in is predictable because we can we can we can make parallels to the past so therefore oh we're safe this is the new renaissance mm. we understand what's going on we have no fucking idea what's going on You know, much as I'd like to say, yes, we're in the new renaissance and everything's fine. So we've got to take we have no idea what's going on. The world is okay. scaling. The, the world is scaling at speed. And because we have no idea what's going on, we have to have a set of skills that we build that, that is a specific set to be responsive to not knowing what's going on. If we start to think, oh, we're in the new renaissance, mm. you're going to start building ideas and, and reactions to if we were in the renaissance what did they do back then to yeah. respond to the changes and challenges back then mm -hmm. and you're going to come up with you're going to come up with the wrong set of solutions to respond to what's going on because you're going to try and 
predict what's happening now and mm. in the future based on what happened in the past. And I think this, I think this, this, and it's it's something that, that mankind seems to do on a consistent basis. Is is the future and the present is not like the Renaissance of the past. It's different. There, there, there are attributes. It's the same people, the same greed, the patrons, the church. It's a very different moment. Are we in a Renaissance? Uh, you know, I don't think so. Actually, like, like if I think about it, like if I think about if I think about the Medici's and their and their willingness to invest in scale in culture, and the papacy's willing to invest in scale in culture, and these guys essentially were back then the these guys were the tech elite of the mm. of the 16th century. It was the center of industry. There was absolutely a profound indifference to culture and art. In, in, in Northern California amongst the tech elite. It's profound, it's consistent. I would, I would almost say there's a scaled indifference to culture and art. So it's a very different relationship to the Medici's or the, or the papacy who had power and capital to, to invest and change the city using art. These people couldn't care less about art. They care about scale. Mm. The word that you brought up earlier in the yeah. conversation, how do we let artists scale as entrepreneurs? All the venture capitalists think about in those in tech is scalability. Scalability mm. trumps culture. And, and this is one of the fundamental problems in the technocracy is that there is no respect or understanding that culture, philosophy, and ideas really define the course of human existence. This is one of the profound, uh, outside, of, outside of the art system, which mm -hmm. is sort of monoculture, consumption, and distribution of art. We have a technocracy that is accumulating capital at a scale that we've never seen before, mm. that has absolutely no, no interest in culture at scale. So, 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 so I would say that in this environment, we have some profound challenges to, mm. to, to, to this. And, and I think those challenges have to be overcome by getting rid of these mythologies that I think alienate a lot of the technocracy from the collecting of art because, because they fundamentally don't buy into those mythologies. Mm. They have a different set of mythologies. So when, when, when we can get rid of the myth, we can then start to sort of have more practical conversations, how, how to, how, how to get, you know, you know, capital is engaged in, 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 in art in a different way. Okay. We, 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 we are in a, a profoundly complex place. Mm. And I, I said this in a talk last week. I am at war. I'm not at war against the right or the left. I'm not at war against an ideology. I'm not at mm. war against one kind of people thinking one thing. I'm at a war to preserve culture in its raw state. Culture as it exists in its pulsating raw state. And, and it's very difficult. And, and, and the art world has sort of said, well, we will preserve this kind of culture. And I have this conversation with many mm. artists. And I, and, and, and I say to artists, yeah. if you voted for Donald Trump and you're an artist in New York City and you publicly tell people that, you will not be invited into a museum mm. show anywhere in the country, mm. no matter how good your art is. This is a problem. Yeah. So, so, you, so you are in war. So who is your enemy? The art world? No, no. culture. Culture. The preservation of okay. The, 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 expa the expansion and preservation mm. of culture. It's not a war against people. Mm. It's a war. It's a war to for something. For something. Yeah. Okay. It's like it's a like war for the environment. Well, to preserve the world. Okay, but you have an enemy because if you are for this, there is other people who who put culture down. I mean, if you want to 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 raise it to to uh, you, you see, I, I, I don't think people act, I don't think people actively put culture down. Oh, it's like I, 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 it's I, a I, 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 atmosphere. I, I don't, you know, I I, I I I don't think people like actively mm. be like we're going to attack culture and kill yeah. culture. I don't think people are even thinking about it. Mm. It's, 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 it's not an it's not an enemy that has a target. Mm. It's an enemy that is that is ignored because it's 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 out of range. I don't think I don't think corporations are like we need to kill mm. culture. I mean we're not. We're, it's not like Soviet times. They're like we need to take the facades of mm. the building because the, because the middle class needs to. But the technocracy, in a strange way, doesn't want to invest in culture because they don't want to be seen as collecting art for its. For its wealth component, they, there's a big fear with the technocracy amongst the wealthy not to be, we call it wealth porn. Mm. They don't want to be participating in wealth porn because that looks bad. Mm. So they, they sort of have this sort of weird kind of like communist, bourgeois, multi billionaire kind of relationship to wealth porn 
you know, it, it, it being seen as spending too much money. Mm. But <clears throat> but so 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 it's it's not really an an an, an enemy per se mm. that that you fight against. It's an enemy that you try to preserve. But but culture, you know, I, I go to Bank of America where I bank, <clears throat> and I walked into my local bank recently, and the decorations really terrible. The walls are bare. Mm. And I say to the banker, can I lend you a piece of art for your office? And the banker says, you know, I would love that. But the bank won't even allow me to hang a photograph of my family on the wall. Mm. So what, what, what the corporate state has done to culture, it has effectively declared war on culture by, by, by commoditizing everything. And the, the corporate state has effectively done what the Soviets did to culture in the post-war period by removing culture from every facade, from every building, because they didn't want the bourgeois to have culture because it was a symbol of wealth and inequality. Mm. So the corporate capital state has essentially removed culture completely from its environment unless they market culture and creativity in their ads to show that they care about your business. In a similar way to how the Marxist and Soviet state. So we live in a, in a strangely authoritarian regime that, that <coughs> targets culture in, in a sense, to, to create uniformity to scale. So I, 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 I think that that culture sits on top here of, of this like pyramid of, of human endeavors, mm -hmm. sort of this like abstract output. And I think like we, we, you, you, you have to sort of challenge the ideologies of the socio-political economic environment underneath there to figure out how can you how can you how can you change corporate structures? I did this very interesting thing with a company called ICM Partners, which is a talent agency in LA, where they called me for some advice about art. Mm. And they were probably going to put prints on the wall, like like normal corporations buy prints of big famous artists and hang them up. Mm. So let me loan you let me loan you <coughs> four hundred works for your offices. I'll curate and hang it like a museum. And they went for it. Has completely transformed their company. The assistants go there every day. They, 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 they experience young art and emerging mm. contemporary art in a way they've never had. And it's literally transformed their brand. <laughs> and I think the art world, artists, distributors, retailers alike, have to really view, they have to really view this kind of, this, this, this requirement to preserve culture in a, in, in a much more engaged and open platform that isn't restricted to like the gallery, the art fair, mm. the museum, the canon, the system. Yeah. They really mm. need to open up. But I, I do think like what you're doing is teaching artists more practical skills, how to communicate through digital media, how to how to disseminate cultural production. These are the things that are going to sort of preserve culture and enable it to escape these monolithic kind of structures. And the exciting thing to is expand the field. Is, expand the field is, is is to counterbalance this darkness and this mm. negativity we have the network mm -hmm. we have these supermarkets that have consolidated and aggregated essentially the entire world into networks that can now be used to distribute through these highways diverse culture but mm -hmm. in order to do so artists need to understand the mechanisms of those constructs those, those uh, they need to understand the, the capital constructs they need to understand the, the the economic constructs the competitive constructs and 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 they do need to learn a whole different set of skills in order to uh to to compete in this environment and a lot of that comes mm -hmm. down to economics a lot of that comes down to basic laws of supply and demand because there is really not a big interest in the big galleries or, or the big distributors to sell mm. inexpensive art because mm. they make more money selling more expensive art. Mm. So, so, so they're better off saying, "Oh, collect real art that's expensive because the inexpensive stuff isn't real. It's not as good as the expensive stuff." So, they, they, they conflate quality with price very easily because it's very convenient to. But mm. I, I don't believe so. I, <clears throat> I believe fundamentally you can build amazing collections with very little money and capital, mm. but. The connoisseur has learned that if it's expensive, it's good because they have no taste. Intrinsically, they don't have that quality of taste, and their knowledge is usually quite narrow. But but the, the art system wants to tell them that they're not not their narrow knowledge. Is they understand the canon, so therefore they're very knowledgeable. Mm. So they can sort of live within this band of thinking they have good taste and thinking they have knowledge by sort of alienating everything else. And and the network as it comes in 
and populates your social media and the mm. people start looking like, well, maybe I'm missing something yet. You slowly creep in and you still mm. start to, to, to open it up. Mm. It's like a, mm. it's like bacteria in the teeth, you know, it's like mm. you, you get it in there and it, it eventually wins. Okay, I see. Ter- terrible analogy, but <laughs> yeah, I have the the image in my in my brain. Okay, so, so I, ju- I just went to the dentist, so I had like a <laughs> and, and a crown, so it's like I can feel it in my teeth. Okay, so uh, now let's talk a little bit about business model. So um, your communication is definitely radical. We can say it. I mean, it's authentic. It's very different. Um, but you, you don't talk a lot about your business model. I mean, concretely, revenue streams, uh, your added value. Is it like, do you consider yourself as a, as a startup, as a, as a venture capitalist? <laughs> I don't consider myself as anything. You know, something and, new. And, and, and something new. You know, it's like my secret sauce. Everyone wants to know, like, the secret sauce. Like, what's the formula? Mm. I view myself as a service provider mm-hmm. uh, to clients and to collectors to, to, to access art. But I think I, I think from a from a, from a con, from my emerging contemporary business, I would say I'm a wholesaler, financier, and distributor. So I wouldn't even say I'm a venture capitalist. I, I would say that in, in, in every business, <coughs> from banking <coughs> to clothing, there is a producer of goods and services mm-hmm. a factory that generates the product the artist generates cultural product mm-hmm. and there are wholesalers financiers and distributors who manage the distribution of those goods and services to retail chains <coughs> to the retailer the mm-hmm. front line <coughs> and those wholesalers um are very powerful because they, they, they help with supply, they help with pricing, they help with volume control, mm. and they help finance the factories by giving the factories an idea of what kind of retail revenue can be had on the front end of the curve. And in, in businesses like the chip industry, for example, which require huge investments in R&D mm. and huge investments in, in capital intensive investments in, in, in machine equipment, This data is very important because if you spend five billion dollars at the wrong time on the wrong chip, you're going to lose money. Or if you're building a refinery and and it takes three years to build, and you have to spend two billion dollars, but the oil market's about to something up to read. The art world, as it has scaled in the post-war period, as it's gone from a handful of collectors and producers of art to thousands <laughs> of collectors and producers of art distributors, hasn't built a supply chain. And and from a, from a business perspective, I believe that the only thing that's going to save emerging contemporary from collapsing into a sort of a mess of, of like, okay, well, one out of a thousand artists gets lucky and makes it for a, a, a set of circumstances that's very specific. There are so many good artists who have failed careers. And I'm not talking about the speculative artists of the bubble of the last five years. I'm talking about artists like Nicholas Gambara, who, who's on my wall right here, mm. who has mm-hmm. a very good gallery, some very good museum shows, whose work appears at auction for a fraction of what you provide for the galleries, is, 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 I, I, it, it has not been looked after in a way whereby the, their supply chain is managed. So, One of the things from a business point of view is I want to create a supply chain for emerging contemporary art where the artist as a factory and producer of art can, can instead of interacting directly with their gallery system, mm. can interact with a wholesaler who can aggregate the demand from different retailers mm. and, and manage that. Because generally what happens when the young artists is they have multiple galleries because It's very risky to show them they might not sell. So it's a very fragmented business. And those galleries don't communicate with each other. They're small operators, many times quite unprofessional. They have some very small infrastructures, and they do it for different reasons. One does it because they like it. Another does it because they're bored. Another does it, you know, because they're, they were an artist. You know, the, the reasons are very different to the big gallery systems. They have a very uncoordinated distribution system of production that is that just kind of gets passed out. So there's no way to build a market because it's... You don't build markets when you just got inventory here and inventory here and inventory here and the galleries don't pay because they don't have money. So the artist suffers 
So what I try and do is sort of by, by acting as a wholesale financier, I can, I, can, I can make sure that the revenue of the artist is more stable over a long period of time so their production can be, can be sustained over a longer period of time. And that's done through helping finance the studio. Because at the end of the day, the, the studio is the factory, and a well-financed factory is going to produce a better product. In any industry, in the chip industry, in the oil, in any industry, a, a, a factory that has stable working capital is going to make a better mm. product. Clever, machines are better. clever capital. It, clever capital, mm. yeah. So I, I think the art business doesn't even, if you ask galleries what working capital is, they don't even know what you're talking mm. about. If you ask us what work, they don't even understand that a successful business turns their working mm. capital three times a year. Mm. They don't even understand this as a, as a metric for, for, for anything. Mm. Working capital is the key to it. So, I think fundamental economic ideas are, are completely non-existent from the system. And the only way to compete with the big galleries to basically tie up an artist's estate who's dead, who's no mm. longer producing in a controlled environment, for emerging contemporary artists who've got factories producing products, is to create a different system. Mm. And the current system of fragmented distribution is completely failed. And, and, and the mythology behind it is that the artist should be free and the, and the, and the gallery should be in control, should do what they love. Is, is, is really is, is really hurting many emerging contemporary artists whose work is very good and make it profoundly difficult for them to have have systematic levels of production over long periods of time. And I've, I've seen it with the artists I've managed, as you sort of say, well, you don't have to worry about collecting that $10,000 from that gallery in Paris that didn't pay you after you did the show and, and you don't have the money for a tube of paint or you don't have money to pay your studio. You, you can just produce the work literally explodes, blossoms. It, it's, it's like a Cambrian explosion. It goes from, from this point where they're doing this to this. And, you, and you, see, mm. you see with young artists, like when the factory, when they don't have to worry about like making 10 phone calls to the Paris gallery to collect $5,000, which shouldn't be their job. Their job should be making art. They're, they're, they can really get into the work and focus. And I think that's fundamentally one of the core things that I do for artists is I say, look, we don't need to sell anything for two years. I mean, I have an artist named Joey Wolf who's fantastic. I've been managing him for three years. Mm. I haven't even tried selling the work. And his work has just gone from strength to strength to strength because all I care about is getting that factory, getting that studio practice humming to a point where the guy is making the best quality product that speaks for itself, that literally you show it to someone, they're going to be like, that's fucking amazing. Shit, mm. I want that. Without any of the games of, oh, it's with this fancy mm. gallery and this curator likes it and this museum is, is talking to it. And because, because these networks are framework, the product, the product is everything for me. Mm. Is, 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 the product is everything. Simple pair at the end. If the product is good, it speaks for itself. How do you, how do you go back to focusing on how to get the artist product to be as good as it possibly can be? And that, and that is really like the core of my focus. So distribution is, 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 is secondary to that. Mm. You know, it really is. It's like the distribution and that all that shenanigans comes, comes secondary to basically making sure that we can have a good product. So this is the definition of do things that don't scale, basically. This is it. Yeah, this is it. Okay. <laughs> so just to, to, to speak a little bit about this. But, 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 but I don't believe it, you know, you know, mm. Everyone wants. Everyone says to me, Why, "How are you going to scale your business? How are you going to scale?" I don't. Care it's not possible. Scale. Is it possible? It's not. No, I don't yes, care about scale. Mm. Okay, you I know, do. And, and, and one of the fundamental flaws in society today, in our global consumption environment, in our technocracy, is this notion of scalability mm. trumps everything. You know, the, the farm to table conversation that we have in the restaurant business, the slow food movement we have. Which are, which are you know the, the artisanal movements we have are very important and have grown in, in Europe have grown mm. in the restaurant business. We, we sort of need a farm to table kind of approach to art, high quality. I'm not interested in having a hundred artists. I don't need a hundred. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not interested in flying on a private plane. I, you know, I I, I, don't, I I have a very good business and I think you can be very successful, but you don't need to generate ten billion dollars in revenue a year. You don't need to scale. And the key is. Is I think if, if many more people sort of have this more artisanal approach, this more sort of uh, this this more precise approach, it's going to be much better. And the problem with unfortunately people like you who've got venture capital money 
uh, in front of you is all you're fixated on is scalability, scalability, scalability. And mm. all that's going to happen is you're going to take advantage of artists because you cannot scale because talent is 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 a rare thing to find and a hard thing to develop and time consuming. So so you know what what one does hope for is 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 where it does scale is if you are able to manage successful artists, the the, the amount of capital that those artists are able to generate today is huge. Mm. You know, I mean Mark Grochan probably sold seventy five million dollars worth of art last year. So so the numbers are enormous. So mm. in a sense in a sense, there is scalability in the amount of money that you could be made, but you kind of can't think about that because because you know once your product is great, you you, you can make a fortune of money, mm. but it, it doesn't scale numerically. It's not it's it's not like oh you can have thousands of people doing this and there be thousands of collectors. It really is. It's a sort of an artisanal opportunity mm. that over time over time scales individually well maybe what what you scale if we have to make this comparison it's maybe your network because i mean in the arts market the the, the battle is to it's always to scale your business is always to expand the field like for example your model uh, today is very close to um leo castelli's friendly galleries for example who try to expand american art into europe or, for example, an, an older example, uh, Paul Durand Ruel, who created a, rev um, a magazine dedicated to art to, to explain, to educate the people to modern art. It's always about expand the field, and maybe this expansion of the field expansion is this scaling, scalability of the art market. I think so. I mean, I think, I, I think expansion of the field is, is key. Whether mm. that scales or not, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah. I don't think it scales like consumer products. I don't think it scales like Facebook scales. At the end of the day, we're talking about the 1%. Mm. So I think what's interesting to me is like, I, I would love to say that, oh, we're, it's democratized art. I mean, within the 1% mm. is, is a 1% and a 1%. So what's interesting to me is scaling within that, with, within the categories mm. of the elites, because I do think that, 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 that the elites, one of the, the world today is like that, that have elitism, if that the elites have lost their, their sense of responsibility. I mean, when the founding fathers, Jefferson and the founding fathers of America, sort of con con conceptualized the House, the Senate, and the state, they sort of said, well, the elites have a responsibility to govern and to lead, and we'll create the House of Representatives <clears throat> as a countermeasure to the Senate and the executive and the legislative branches. But what's happened today is the elites have sort of forgone their opportunity of leadership. They, mm -hmm. they have... They have sort of they they've sort of said well we're no longer responsible we we you know all 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 all, all, all we have to do is sort mm. of become sort of rich as that but the elites do have a responsibility to the preservation of culture and capital like so you know like there's another confusing thing that's I'm a populist I'm not an elitist and you know and I, I you know <clears throat> and I, I sort of disagree with that I think that there are people who have opportunities to. To, 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 to use their elite position to sort of to, 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 to get culture out there and preserve, and the culture will be preserved by the elites. It's not going to be preserved by the struggling farmer in Idaho. It's only going to be preserved by the people working at a McDonald's and in the interstate. And to, and to think otherwise, that culture must be for everyone, is problematic. You know, I, 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 I use these science fiction in the in one of the latest Star Trek movies. Uh, they 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 test this terrible weapon on, on the planet Vulcan where Spock's parents mm. live, and he's faced with a choice: do I go and try and save the people of Vulcan, or do I save the the elders who are the keepers mm. of knowledge, math, science, philosophy? And he goes to save the elders because he realizes if he saves them, he can take them and find another planet for them and preserve the culture of of the Vulcan race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the most important thing to preserve was the culture. Because then they could rebuild, they could they could rebuild the Vulcan race. But if you save the people mm. and not the culture, you would be you would be gone. You, mm -hmm. you would literally be lost. So like you you could you, you could think about the world in a sense like imagine if well, you got rid of all those. Huh? Yeah, this is a philosophical point of view. I maybe not quite agree with that, but it's it's well. Go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. If, if, if you could. If, if you could have a chance yeah. 
of saving, of, 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 of getting rid of all human knowledge mm -hmm. of history, art, culture, science, philosophy, math, mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. and, just, and just leaving the people on earth who had none of it. Mm -hmm. So you, you had that choice. And, and let's say, you would, it's an interesting ethical mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Would you save the lives of, let's say, 500 million people or lose the lives of six and a half billion? But but within the within the lives that you that you lose, you lose all history and knowledge of, of the human race, all scientific discovery, all culture, all art. It's an interesting choice. Mm -hmm. what, what what like what what should, what, should they, <laughs> how, what should you do? How do you define a species? This is interesting. Um, <coughs> this That's is interesting. I I think I should I sh I take the second option. Which is that to save I, the six and a half yeah, million? Yeah, yeah. Because if if you trust that all this knowledge, because well, other question. We we speak about um, scientific knowledge about this is a very occidental point of view because our knowledge is not people's in Amazonia knowledge because we uh, as occidental people we we went there we destroyed the forests and they had a lot of knowledge about the forest you're, about you're, you're getting you're, you're getting re you, those people are surviving the people in the ah, in, in the five millions in the five million, well, five, million is, five million it's a lot if you take five against five people against six point five billion, this is another question. I'm saying five hundred billion. I'm saying <laughs> the people in the Amazon forest survive. They survive. They have knowledge. No, because they you see, have... if if all the singularity brings a little a little thing, and I think that six point five billion is more relevant like, than five million or five. This is well. <laughs> It's not maybe not the question, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so um, interesting. So maybe two questions to finish. Um, uh, this is a big question. Unfortunately, <laughs> it will. Ça va durer encore longtemps. Well, uh, another question: Is the art market? Uh, uh, is it possible to disrupt the art market? Because we see that. All uh, the industry, all the industries are being disrupted now. Even the industries with the highest barriers to entry, like uh, education, um, healthcare, a lot of things like that. Uh, so, is the art market the last industry to be disrupted? Is it possible? Is it what yeah. you are doing? I'm disrupting it. How? But it, the industry couldn't be disrupted like the education industry. It's not. It doesn't get disrupted by. <clears throat> you know, I got an ad from Artsy the other day, Carter Cleveland's company, mm. and the ad was, we can help you analyze your investments in art. Before you buy a piece of art, pay us an $800 consulting fee, and we'll pay mm -hmm. you if it's a good investment or not. And I was thinking about it, and I was kind of abused. I was like, this is the company that's disrupting the art business mm. by sending out mass emails saying, hey, we can help you invest in art. They're not disrupting it at all. All they're doing is they, they, they're, they're doing quite the opposite. They're digging their heels in and they're scaling the system. And then when you register on art and you say, I'm interested in this artist, when you email a gallery, a pop-up window appears and says, are you a collector? Have you bought from auction before? What is in, in your collection? If you tell us what's in your collection, it's more likely that the gallery is going to respond favorable, favorably to you because if your collection is good. So they are actually proliferating these kind of mythological mm. concepts that are you a collector, are you a good collector, watch it. They're doing the exact same thing that the gallery is doing, they're just putting it online. Mm. They're not actually disrupting. They're reinforcing the system. They're reinforcing the idea that you identify art with investment. They're reinforcing the idea that you're a good collector if you own other things. They're reinforcing all these myths at scale. That's not disruption, that's reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Disruption of the art industry is not going to happen by building a website. It's not going to happen by building a consolidated website that basically changes the business. It's going to happen in the same way that a virus creates a mutation in a species, and the species evolves based on that mutation. It's the same way that, that we've evolved to have uh, smaller appendixes mm. or smaller ears or less facial hair. Culture 
is a is 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 sort of part of the evolution of the species in a sense. So I think there is it is open for disruption, but it's not open for disruption in the classical way as you as a venture capitalist are thinking, oh gee, there's gonna be one guy who invents some company is gonna disrupt the art business. It's gonna happen as a set of ideas and principles that travel through the network and get mm-hmm. picked up by people and then evolve that way. In in a similar way, and if if you look at if you look at history what are the ideas that change history? It's not companies that change history. It's not the guy who started the Venetian yachting company that started like, you know, making the merchant mm. marine. The real disruption has come from ideas. The world is no longer flat. It's round. Huge idea. Changes everything. You know, Edwin mm. Hubble, uh, this, the, the, the universe is not just the galaxy. There are other galaxies mm. beyond 1923 changes everything, changes the way we see our species, changes everything. So I think the art business will get disrupted, but it's going to get disrupted by breaking down mm. the, the, the mythologies of morality that have kept the art industry in its stasis in the last 50 years and breaking these barriers. I think it gets disrupted in a way whereby no one person gets the benefit and credit of that disruption. So like there's a Mark Zuckerberg of disruption in the art industry. Mm. It's going to be shared by a lot of people. It's going to be a highly distributed and, and non-linear form of disruption. And it is underway. It's, it's absolutely happening. Mm. Um, it just, it's just not something that can be consolidated and owned. Mm. So, 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 so yes, it will be. But it, it, it's, not, it's not the linear disruption like, oh, these guys invented... Uh, yeah, you know, service or software. Service, yeah. 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 Because, 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 because cultural see, yeah. production mm. is so complex. It's such a complex output of human endeavor. It mm. deals with philosophy, ideas, mathematics... Mm. performance i mean you know i i believe that the the greatest conceptual artists living today are theoretical physicists Mm. i mean you know you know and and theoretical mathematicians i believe that they are actually amongst the greatest conceptual artists of our time Mm. and if you think about it they 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 are they they're they're thinking in in, they're they're thinking in terms of culture Mm. using using every single capability that man has in its ability to think and, and, and hypothesize in their mind. So I think about culture more broadly. My, my definition of cultural production and artistic production is probably far broader than a traditional gallerist or museum director. It's, mm-hmm. it's, its scope is a little bit wider. I think there's a lot of artistic production that is made that, that isn't defined as artistic production by the industry, but actually is at the core completely artistic. I think mm-hmm. the Wright brothers, who I just read the Wright brothers' biography, I think I think they weren't inventors; they were artists. They were literally mm. artists. If you if you read their book, they lived like artists. They thought like artists. They were obsessive like artists. They, 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 these were not like industrialists, you know. They, they, these guys were these guys were absolute creators. Mm-hmm. They, they were. They, they were absolute creators. They were not, uh, you know. So I, I think I think you got to you got to sort of increase the definitions and terms of, of, of what you call art, mm-hmm. and then you sort of then you can have a different conversation. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> nice, nice. Okay. Okay. Very good. And maybe. The last question for this uh, Unchain My Art 3, um, what would be the three advice um, you would give to emerging artists? Three major advice to artists who listen to us. Make yourself as easily reachable and visible as possible. Have a Facebook profile, an Instagram profile. Have your phone number and website on that profile. Answer your phone whenever it rings. Check your emails consistently. Make yourself totally and easily accessible so that when someone calls, whoever it is, you're there. Communicate. Communicate who you are. Don't put pictures of like cool things that you saw online. Uh, you know, make your identity so we see your face, we see your family, we contextualize your studio. So someone who can look at your social media can have within immediacy, not like some like goofy pictures of oh, you're another website. Make it so it's very easy to sort of understand who you are, where you are, what your story is, what your production is. Make it really easy to read because there's so many social media profiles and websites. You go to the arts and you have no idea who you're dealing with. It's mm-hmm. like some goofy, funny website. Make it simple. We're stupid out there, most of us, including myself. Make it easy for us. 
<laughs> cool. <laughs> Perfect. Nice. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Stefan, for Thank you so much. Uh, for being with us. Pleasure. Thanks. Bye -bye.